Welcome and listen to God's greeting from Psalm 118:24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know when that was written, it was not written just for Sunday, but for every day. So that every day we can say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In the last few years, we've heard much about the Ten Commandments and where they should be displayed and where they ought to be. And I think the proper place for them is in church and in our hearts, the hearts of believers. And I want to read for you God's law. So listen to these words from Exodus 20, the first 17 verses. And God spoke all these words, saying... I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth underneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your manservant or your maidservant or your cattle or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or his maidservant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. That's God's law for us. We're going to have a time of confession. We're going to confess, perhaps, first, a violation of the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill. You say, well, Mr. Hoffman, I haven't killed anybody in the past week. Well, we'll see about that. Let me give you an illustration of a child, high school girl named Violet. Violet didn't um, always fit in with the crowd. She was kind of clumsy and not too good looking. She was not dressed well, and sometimes adults would say, well, she's a wallflower. And one day, she fell in the cafeteria, and things went all over from her tray. And many people laughed and ridiculed her for that. And a little bit of Violet died. Violet was killed by that. You know, violets are tiny and tender. And what they need are love and care and attention. And that's what Christians should give them. We who recognize human life as a gift from God, And it's not enough that we do not kill our neighbor. God tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Protect her from harm as much as we can and do good even to our enemies. The positive side of the sixth commandment is that we have to love one another. Don't trample the violence. Don't kill the violets 
that are in your path through neglect or apathy. Now I know that there is in our midst an angel that when Virginia or Violet crossed her path, she invited her out and showed her love. And now that Violet is a little closer to heaven. God has given us good examples to follow as well. There are other confessions we should make, and I have one. Some of you have heard this before. Some of you also know that I kind of like to go fishing from time to time. And um, many people smile when they hear that, but I want to remind you that there were a good number of our Lord's disciples who were fishermen. Sometimes they stayed out all night, we read. I don't quite do that. But one day I was fishing, and I got one fish, and as I was leaving the boat ramp, I saw a person walking down the bank who was going to go fishing. And so I stopped and got out and said to him, Would you like a fish? Because I just had one. And he said, Oh, yes, sir. I sure would. And as I went in the boat to get the fish, and he turned and started walking up towards me, I turned around and he said, Sir, would you put that fish on this stringer for me? And I thought, What's going on here? Here I am, the great benefactor, and this guy wants me not only to take my fish, but to put it on the stringer for him. And then he turned slightly so that I could see him, and I noticed that he had a withered arm. He only had the use of one hand. And immediately the Lord touched me and said, Don't be judgmental and be thankful for what you have. I can't even imagine what it's like to bait a hook or to take a fish off the hook with one arm, one hand. The Lord gave me one fish that day and two lessons. Don't be judgmental. Be thankful for what you have. If we confess our sins, we receive this assurance of pardon from God's word. 1 John 1, 19, we read, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The title of the message is Trees Walking. The scripture is Mark chapter 8, and I'll read that for you in a few minutes, verse 22 to 26. By way of introduction, let me say that Jesus and his disciples have been ministering for some time. There are 16 chapters in Mark, and this, so this is just about halfway through. This is just after Jesus, the story, just after Jesus had fed 4,000 people. You'll recall once that he fed 5,000 people, but here in Mark he fed 4,000. Jesus also had had a run-in with the religious authorities, and the disciples had some misunderstandings. You'll notice in verse 21, just immediately before what I am about to read, that Jesus asked the disciples, Do you still not yet understand There is still much that they do not understand. Let's listen to God's word. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him, begged Jesus, to touch him. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands upon him, Jesus asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then again he laid his hands upon his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored and saw everything clearly. And he sent him away to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Mario Lemieux. 
He was one of the two or three greatest ice hockey players of all time. He was on two Stanley Cup championship teams. He was in the Hall of Fame. At the height of his career, he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, and he had to take three years off. He then returned to play. And after that, I am told, there was something about his play that set him apart from other players. He had no wasted motion. Every move had a purpose to it. There was no movement, no energy expended without that purpose in mind. Like a ballerina, every move seemed to be choreographed with a purpose that a goal might be achieved. Nothing was wasted. When Jesus walked this earth, he had no wasted motion. Everything he did served a purpose or served to teach some lesson. His words, his actions were all directed toward achieving a goal. And that goal was to reveal the Heavenly Father to us and to teach us about entering into a relationship with the Father. The passage we read just a moment ago is about a blind man being healed. But as we unwrap this story, we find that it is about much more than just a man having his sight restored. It is a lesson for the disciples of Jesus, and it is a classroom for those of us who witness this story 20 centuries later. The setting for the story is the little village of Bethsaida on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus and his disciples arrive at this village by boat, and Jesus is no stranger to the people of this town. As a matter of fact, Matthew, in his gospel, tells us that Jesus performed many miracles in Bethsaida. And some of the villagers who hear that Jesus is back in town bring a blind man to Jesus so that he can touch him. But Jesus does something out of the ordinary with this man. We are told that he takes him by the hand and leads him outside the village. Then Jesus takes saliva and uses it as a salve to put on the man's eyes. After that, Jesus places his hands on the man and he asks him, Can you see anything? The man replies, Why, yes, I can. I see people, but they look like trees walking. The man had partial vision. He can see shadows and images, but his sight is clouded and blurred. It's as though he has cataracts over his eyes. So Jesus reaches out and touches the man's eyes again. And we are told that after the second touch, the man sees everything clearly. This is the only healing in the Gospels in which Jesus touches someone twice. And the obvious question is, why? Why did Jesus have to touch this man twice for his vision to be restored. Jesus healed many other people, even several other people who were suffered from blindness. As a matter of fact, just two chapters later, in Mark 10, we are told that Jesus will heal blind Bartimaeus. And he, there he won't touch him at all. He'll simply tell him that his faith has made him whole. So why does Jesus touch this man twice? Well, obviously, it's not a matter of Jesus' ability to heal someone. His power is not in question here. Something else must be going on. As we read the Gospel of Mark, we discover that the people who follow Jesus, including his disciples, are a lot like this blind man. They have trouble seeing clearly. This man is symbolic of those who are following Jesus at this crucial time in his ministry. They have come to Jesus in spiritual blindness. They are unable to see the presence of God in their lives. They have been with Jesus for some time, and they've witnessed his life, they've heard his teaching, and they are starting to understand who he is, but they still don't see 
clearly. They do not fully grasp his mission. They have no concept that Jesus is going to die a shameful death on the cross and that he will bear the penalty for the sins of humanity. There are so many things that they are unable to understand. Their vision is clouded and they need a second touch. And so this story is introduced with a question that Jesus has asked his disciples, do you still not yet understand? Well, if you're very familiar with the Gospel of Mark, you may know that Jesus is about to give his disciples a second touch. And I invite you to go home this afternoon to read this eighth chapter of Mark's Gospel and to notice the theme of understanding and seeing and how that works and how Jesus uses that to make things clear to his disciples. Because immediately after this healing story here in Mark 8, Jesus takes his disciples north. He travels with them north to Caesarea Philippi, and there he asks the ultimate question, Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and makes that great affirmation of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. And we are told then that Jesus begins to teach them plainly and clearly about his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. It is as though the disciples need a second touch in order to understand his mission. And even then, the disciples still do not see the mission of Christ clearly. Peter still argues with Jesus over his purpose in life. The disciples, it seems, in fact, need touch after touch after touch. And I think the fact is that most of us who have come to faith in Christ, most of us who acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior, are like this blind man. We have been touched by God not only once, but many times. It is as though God works in our lives and gradually grows us into faith. Or it may take a while. It may take God working in our lives and in various ways before we are at that place where we are transformed and the light bulb comes on and we can say, oh yes, I see it clearly now. Jesus is the Son of God. I believe what I have been confessing and affirming. How many people, how many of you have said, I came to know Christ when I was a child, but realized that you were 28 or 42 or 65 before you clearly understood what that meant to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. I was in a nursing home this past Thursday evening talking to someone who was nearly 88. And as God plans, this man told me of a second touch he had received at the age of 40. He has been touched many times And in the last year particularly, he has come to recognize an angel that God has sent to him, his niece. He is so grateful that he got tears in his eyes as I sat there at his bedside. So I was touched by God at that bedside. For most of us, God works in us for quite a while, planting seeds, watering those seeds, bringing people and bringing circumstances our way before we are clear and settled on the matter of who Jesus is. Some of you in the sanctuary this morning may very well be in that process of growth. God is at work in your life right now, moving you into a relationship with him through various means and various circumstances and various people who come in and out of your life, those violets whose paths you cross. And you are in the process of coming to an understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done for you and what he expects you to do for others. It's as though you have limited vision. You're still not completely clear, but God is at work. I recently um, heard a story about an old 
sea-worn sailor who was spending his last days in a naval hospital. He was literally on his deathbed. A young chaplain was sent in to pray with the old man because the nurses who cared for him sensed that he was close to the end. As the young chaplain sat by the bedside, he said to this old sailor, Sir, are you sorry for all of your sins? And the chaplain was astonished to hear the man's reply. The old sailor said, Well, to be perfectly honest with you, Reverend, I'm not. I rather enjoyed some of the things I did. And I suppose it's not what I'm supposed to say. But if I'm going to be honest, Reverend, I have to tell you, I'm not really sorry. Many ministers would have given up on the old man at that point and turned away with the attitude, well, you old reprobate, if that's your attitude, then you deserve what it is you get. But this young chaplain had wisdom beyond his years, and he understood something about patient grace. The sailor had been honest with him, and to come to God, honesty is a requirement. So the young chaplain said to him, Well, sir, let me ask you one other question. If you're not sorry for your sins, are you sorry that you're not sorry? There was a long pause, and the chaplain saw tears forming in the eyes of that rugged old sailor. And finally, with great conviction, the old man replied, You know, Reverend, I can truly say that I am sorry that I am not sorry. And in answering that second question, the old man cracked open the door to the grace of God. So often, it is the second touch, the second question, that second introspection that is required. Someone once said it this way, he said, Christian progress doesn't consist in seeing new things, but in seeing old things more clearly. But what if, what if the blind man in Mark 8 had been satisfied with that first touch? What if he had said to Jesus, yes, Jesus, I can see a little bit. I can see people like trees walking. And so I don't want to risk a second touch. I'm satisfied now with the vision I have. Oh, it's not much, but it's more than I had before. If he had had that attitude, how much of the color and texture of life would have been missed? The fact is, even after we come to faith in Christ, if we are not careful, we can stunt our growth and never move beyond a childish faith that only sees a cloudy vision of what God wants to do through us. As modern-day disciples, we can actually suffer from impaired vision and refuse to see God's plan. Some believers never get past seeing walking trees. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul offers this prayer for the believers in Ephesus. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which God has called you. Sometimes we never fully grasp what God has for us. We don't grasp that hope that is at work in our lives because we become satisfied with trees walking. We're unwilling to risk the second touch. Someone once said, you get as much of God as you want. Well, how much do you want? It's like this summer when it was 102 degrees outside and you perspire, you get in the shower and find out that there's only a trickle of water. And you do your best to get clean, but you cannot. So you wait a few days or whatever until it's repaired and then shower again and enjoy the running, flowing water. The first one may have been a shower, but did you need the second washing? You sure did. If we are not careful as Christians, we can become satisfied with the trickle. 
and we can experience God to the level of just seeing trees walking. Just having enough vision to get by and never bathing in the deep flowing waters that God has for us. Never getting that clear vision of what God wants to do in us and through us. Some of us have issues that need to be dealt with, that need a second touch, but we've become satisfied with walking trees. My prayer for all of us today, including me, starting with me, is that we would not be satisfied so easily, that we would seek that second or third or fourth or tenth touch, that we would bathe in the flowing waters and allow God to take us deeper. Pray this week, friends. Pray that you would grow deeper and grow closer to God because it is that second touch that enables us to see how much we are missing. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for the first touch, but we thank you for the second touch and beyond as well. For so often our vision is not clear. We just see trees walking. And so often it's as if we're bathing in a trickle. So Lord, help us to be open to another touch that we can see your purpose clearly, that we can bathe in the deep waters, that we can grow to be all that you have designed us to be. We pray in your name. Amen.